DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys? Yeah! This, this is Radiohead. Broadcasting live on DallasCowboys.com and the official Dallas Cowboys app. Now your hosts, Tyler Klutz, Christy Scales, and Brad Sham. I'm Christy. He's Tyler. Brad Sham sends his apologies with our crazy short work week from a Monday night football game to a Sunday night game and a change in practice schedule. Brad got called by Cowboys Marketing to some last minute MC duties in mm-hmm. Grapevine. So, Tyler, it's it's you and me today. And we already have a question from Jane down in Bryan, Texas, who says, Tyler, have you ever had a cat run on the field when you played? If not, what's the craziest thing that ever happened in one of your games or practices? Uh, no cat i've had squirrels a couple times and i feel like it's always new york because we played the uh, we was in the uh uh meadowlands uh, not the meadowlands it was still uh, MetLife. metlife stadium yeah, metlife mm-hmm. uh, but uh yeah the squirrels on the field but never had a black cat and, and the, the power went out at metlife too yes. that was the first year that metlife actually that was no it wasn't the first year it was but uh, it was the 9 11 game against the jets yeah and it was kind of scary because it was like the 10 year anniversary of uh, the. Oh, that, so that was my very first game in the NFL. I was in Chicago at the time. Really? Yes, that was wow. my very first game. Wow. But. Yeah. But, but what about, didn't you have like dogs and stuff in the park when you were playing for, was that Sacramento? Well, that was practice. Yeah. That so, was cause, practice? yeah, because we had to, we had to all carpool over to the local park <laughs> in order to practice for the Arena Football League. Um, and so, yeah, so we tripped over a couple dogs and. Uh, I don't know whatever the whatever the support animals are now a little mini horse you or bet. something like that. You bet. So. Well, we want to talk about some key plays besides the black cat on mm-hmm. Monday night game, and then look ahead to going against Mike Zimmer and the Vikings defense and uh, Cook and Cousins with the Vikings yeah. offense. But a couple of plays that really stand out in the game. Obviously, the opening play for Cowboys offense, yeah. first play that interception, mm-hmm. and I know that people look at it and think, "What was Dak doing?" He threw it exactly into the gut. Uh, It was Antoine Bethea, the safety, number 41 for the Giants, who made a great play. Yeah, yeah. So... (sighs) A couple a couple things happened on this play. One, it was it was a run pass option. So safety comes, Bethea comes down in the box, and Dak then checks out of the run play because it looked like it was going to be a weak run right into that. So when that happens, you've got to check out of it. So also when the safety comes down, you're going to try to sneak a route out behind the safety because he comes into the box. You're gonna you you think that okay he's going to play the run, he's going to be run heavy. Well, he just stood there and stayed. So a couple things. Yes, his eyes were not great. And he could have seen that, but it's it's also hard because you saw him. He takes his quick drop back, and then he pats the ball a couple times and waits, and then throws the ball. And he was just there. He just kind of yeah. snuck up behind a guy, and right. he was there. When he's tucked into the box like that, it's hard to see. Now, if he's you know if he's five seven yards off the line of scrimmage, like you can see that. But he was like three or four, just kind of hanging in there right behind you know the guards uh, and the D tackles. So it's tough. His eyes weren't perfect, but you know you can't. You can't get too upset over something like that. It was a freak deal. You know, very rarely is that ever going to happen. Yeah, and sometimes you just have to tip your hat to the defender because Bethay he baited call. him on it. He and, totally yeah, did. He did. It really looked was like a he great was coming call. down and then dropped back just enough to be right in the passing lane. That's and, right. I mean, right in his right in his chest. But I will say that, uh, you know, obviously the first play, so it's sudden change defense, mm-hmm. right? And they go out there, and the Giants have the ball on yeah. the Cowboys eight yard line, and three plays after that, they're having to settle for a field cool. goal. Huge. So great job of uh, stopping Barkley on a couple of short runs. Mm-hmm. And then Heath had the uh, pass big... defense against uh, Red Ellis in the tight end. Right. But then he also caused a bad pass in the end zone right there. He came in and I don't, I think it was that drive. He, or it was later. It was another goal line stand that they had and he came in and hit oh, Daniel Jones. Yeah. yeah. Blitzed mm-hmm. off blitzed the off. Left, mm-hmm. left edge and disrupted the pass. It was a bad pass. Um, I mean, granted the coverage was good, but um, got to give Jeff Heath you know, credit for both of those plays. And, and really the entire defense, Jalen Smith blitzed a lot, but it's something mm-hmm. that we were talking about. I, I like Daniel Jones a lot, yeah. but something that we were talking about that we saw from him, it's something that Rod Marinelli predicted yeah. Yeah. on the sideline with me a couple hours before kickoff. He, and this is common among young quarterbacks, but he said, when you can pressure him, mm-hmm. particularly up the middle, but anytime you get some pressure, his eyes go down. Yeah. In football parlance, what does a quarterback quarterback's 
eyes going down. Maybe. So when you look at the veterans, you look at the Aaron Rodgers, the Tom Brady's, the Ben Roethlisberger's, the Philip Rivers, right? The Romos when he was here, their eyes were always where they needed to be because you have to trust the guys around you. You have to rely on that sixth sense to feel the pressure on the outside. But a young quarterback is anytime they feel pressure up in their face, they're going to take their eyes off of their target. And once you take them off, this game is so fast. Once your eyes are off of your target, you can't come back and find that target and make a good, accurate throw where you need to be for the most part. You know, mm-hmm. there's the there's the Patrick Mahomes that do this stuff all the time and get away with it because of their arm strength and their athletic ability. But the second his eyes come off of that target, now to come back, the ball is usually late. It's off timing. And, you know, inches are everything in this game. So if you can get his eyes to come down, and you saw it a lot in this game. Right? Anytime he'd feel a little bit of pressure, yeah. he'd take off his running. His eyes were down to run. That's exactly right. Mm-hmm. Hence the fumble, and hence you know a, a couple mistakes that he made through this game because his eyes came off the target. Like with, we were talking before the show, Brady... His eyes are going to be on his target after he gets sacked. Right. You know, because right. his eye, he's disciplined and he trusts his guys and he understands, like, okay, if I've got to get hit, but I am not going to make a bad decision and turn this ball over. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Daniel Jones having the fumble on one of those keepers. Xavier mm-hmm. Woods had the forced fumble. Yep. He had the uh, interception off Daniel Jones and uh, Xavier Woods honored today with NFC yes. Defensive Player of the Week yes. honors. And so, also sparked the defense and really the whole yeah. team in the se- that second half on that sideline. Um, yeah, that sideline incident. <laughs> that that is the second closest I've ever come to being taken out on the yeah. sideline. Luckily, I was about two feet away from the ESPN guy, the parabolic mic operator. Yeah. That's the dish thing that's yeah. used for the sound effects, and I was just a couple feet away from him, and he's the one that went sprawling, <laughs> but so much so that the parabs actually hit my feet. But yes, it was uh, literally ringside for the melee that happened, yeah. and I know that um, Cowboys Nation, certainly the entire sideline, very upset that Xavier Woods was called for taunting, taunting. on that, and everyone yeah. felt that Will Hernandez, the uh, guard for the Giants who mm-hmm. came over and kind of mm-hmm. did some pushing and started the melee there. And by the way, it kind of set the tone for the entire second half. Yeah. Uh, remainder of the second half with just some of the penalties well, you saw that were Witt happening. Get lit up when Wit yeah. gets fired up. Yeah. Everybody gets fired yeah, up. Yeah. And he so does. Mm-hmm. yeah, and and that deal. So and, and we talked about it too before the show is. You know, the ref was pulling the flag before Hernandez even got there. Yeah. So something was said, right? When they call taunting and not, you know, unnecessary roughness or That's personal the, foul or anything like that. You're you're on it, Tyler, because when with the taunting, he said something, and what had happened was Xavier Woods it was actually face to face, face mm-hmm. mask to face mask yeah. with Evan Ingram, the tight end for the Giants, because Ingram was the closest, so he was the first one over yeah. to take exception yeah. to Daniel Jones being pushed. Um, <coughs> it was not late. Jones was in bounds when he was. He was. Uh, it was totally illegal. But but actually, it was the line judge who was throwing the flag, and he was already reaching for it um, and trying to break up Woods and Ingram, and that's when Hernandez uh, yeah. came in, and then things really got uh, crazy after that. Yeah. But there's, there's one other play that I want us to um, dissect, and you talk about coaching points on yeah. this, and this is one of the real highlights from the game, and that's the Michael Gallup touchdown pass, which mm-hmm. ha- also had a front row seat for that. One of the yeah. most amazing athletic plays that you'll see. Yes. Uh, the way he was able to tightrope down the sideline, catching the ball eight yards out and then diving and somersaulting into the end zone. But it's pre-snap yeah. with that particular play. Uh, it looks like it was called to be uh, maybe a, a short, quick out to Michael Gallup, but that was actually uh, a mm-hmm. run play. Yeah. And the Cowboys thought that they had a free play on that. Dak mm-hmm. and Travis Frederick, uh, the uh, Giants had encroached. They thought that they were going to have a penalty and a free play on that. But um, Travis went ahead and snapped it early to yeah. Dak. And so uh, Dak was able to throw it just over the outstretched arms of the defender and Gallup caught it on the sideline. But can you take us through the points of a, of a play? It's not just the center and the quarterback that have to be on the same page when you quick snap. Can you tell us about what the mm-hmm. rules are for all the offense? Yeah, so so on that play, and by the way, I mean, everyone that's listening, like the great reporting that you just did and finding out, okay, that wasn't that wasn't a cold pass route, right? It, it, 
with with Kellen in this offense, he was motioning Zeke back into the backfield for a run play. Yeah, he and, stopped. And, yeah, Zeke hadn't even motioned back yet. He literally stopped, and then um, and then Travis obviously snapped it. Um, because what he what he tries to do is anytime they jump off sides, Travis has free reign to snap the ball to catch him to get the offsides to get the free play. So when that happens, everybody knows. Okay, if it's off cadence, we've just get, we're going for it. We're throwing it up, and then you know Michael Gallup you know went down the sideline, gave him a target. Dak just got it over the fingertips, and actually I think it was tipped into Gallup's finger in, into his hands. But what happens is anytime it's an off timing play like that, you know, okay, we're just going to go for it. And obviously the athleticism afterwards when he jumped over him, got his foot down and then into the end zone. I mean, it was unbelievable. But it's one of those deals like you could tell like Zeke just turned around and kind of just bounced there and was just waiting. When that happens, you know, it's like, okay, I don't have anywhere to go and I want to make sure that I'm not getting downfield. Yeah. And then same with the offensive oh, line. That's then. right. Because it's because, a run play. Because if it's a run, yeah, now the offensive man lineman downfield. could be working up to linebackers right. and get downfield. They know if it's off, we got to stay here and just, excuse me, and just protect. And so Zeke was kind of the same way, just like I'm going to get out of the way because someone could be running across her. It's it's literally backyard football at that point because there's no play called for him. Well, backyard football, but at the same time, an amazing amount of discipline and recognition because it's yeah. not like a code word, right? It's no, just no, 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 no. Yeah, you can't. Seeing... Yeah, there's no way you can signal to your receivers when mm-hmm. Travis snaps it on his own timing because they flinch or jump off sides, which we obviously didn't get. But it's yeah, and I say backyard football. I just mean like yeah, you, you just it's hey, not get, it's not get open, yeah. get open, yeah. do what you got to do to get open. The, the, and there are rules. Yes. I mean, it's just like um, the div, uh, defensive backs talk about when you're playing like an Aaron Rodgers, yeah. and you know that he's a guy mm-hmm. or a Deshaun Watson. Mm-hmm. These guys who can extend plays instead of three seconds covering a yeah. wide receiver, they're going to get loose in the pocket. Now you're having to cover a That's guy right. for six or seven seconds. That's right. And you That's exactly some, right. And and, 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 again, and those receivers have rules yeah, too. To be able being able to improvise while still playing within the system, and that's what Aaron Rodgers is so good at, mm-hmm. right? Is he can improvise. But a receiver knowing, okay, hey, I've got a slot inside of me, so I got to know that I can't just run a quick slant. I got to stay out of his way. I've you know I've got to understand where. Uh, where the other pieces to the puzzle are around me, and I've got to find my own spot and get open while improvising. Yeah. So that was really, I mean, for, for for Gallup being the young receiver that he was to make that yes. play, Dak to be able to do what he did and find him and get the ball. I mean, that was really impressive, and that's and that's the sign of a a maturing team. Yeah. We had a question from Bailey at Stephen F. Austin State University who wants an update on Leighton Vanderesh. And uh, we're all kind of waiting for that mm. update. Leighton, of course, missed Monday night's game with a neck strain. It was from going back to the uh, an injury suffered in the game against the Eagles. And so um, expect that he'll probably be limited. Yeah. Ho- hopefully he'll be able to participate and practice some this week. But uh, again, it goes back to a conversation that yeah, I had with Rod before the game, what a luxury mm-hmm. to have Sean not just Lee. Sean Lee but Joe Thomas as yeah. well to yeah. step up and and I know as a former teammate of Sean that you're yeah. really enjoying seeing him yes. get the uh, added number of reps. Yeah, and you know he got the nickname the General for a reason, right? And he's he's as much of a general on the team as he is to himself, and so someone that demands such high standards that he has over the years and to be able to perform the way that he has for the years when healthy. Um, and being out, out there. And then also to have last year and have the limited number of snaps that he had last year and the beginning of this season, and to be able to go out and still perform at an extremely high level, you know, tied with Jalen for tackles for the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I think he had nine solo tackles. I mean, that's an impressive, it, that's an impressive showing. Yeah, and it wasn't just, I mean, it, and these were open field tackles yeah. often against Saquon Barkley, yeah. who's one of the great break, you know, he's great I mean, at breaking tackles I really, in open space. I really would argue that. You know, he is probably the most complete back in the NFL. I mean, you got to put him and and Zeke in the same category, but there's, I mean, you saw on the screen what he was able to do with mm-hmm. it in the open field, right? The breakaway mm-hmm. speed. And Zeke's been open about talking about, I've got to hit the big runs this year. I don't have any of the big long runs. Saquon always does. Like he, he has that ability to break them for 80, you know, 70, yeah. 80 yards. But, to open to, to have an open field tackle with a guy like that that has the lower body strength that he has the quickness that he has the athleticism 
athleticism and agility that he has, I mean, shows that Sean still has it. And I mean, you look at, I'm not getting on Cowboys Nation, but for the most part, people wrote him off and like, oh, he's done, he's washed up. And then I think Witt is the same same way, right? He continues to get better as the season is going on. And okay, you're seeing youthful Jason Witten just like you're now seeing youthful Sean Lee. Yeah, this is definitely the healthiest that Sean has been at this yep. point of the season for yeah. the last few years. But let's talk about his uh, snaps. Mm-hmm. Uh, first of all, Jalen Smith also had, you mentioned Stud. that he, yeah, yeah he, Played 72 of 72 defensive snaps yeah. uh, on Monday night. God, it's going to be so tough with this short work week. I was going to say, how, yeah. how are you recovering from the short? <laughs> not, not well. Because 5 a.m. landing, well, is that well, what it was? We landed, uh, let's see, Chris, are you in there? William, it was about uh, 4.20, I think we uh, landed. I know I, about 4.20. We were supposed to land a little after 4. We were only about 15 or 20 minutes late. But um, I got home a little after 5. It's a little harder uh, to recover. I think William would say the same thing as well as... Now, nothing, that, now that William's a dad and there's is, a kid at home, <laughs> until yeah, because when you get – and Tyler's a yeah, dad too, yeah. so you don't just get to go home and crash like me, uh, who's childless. But um, the, I do want to talk about a, a short work week, and as mm-hmm. it pertains especially yeah. to a guy like Witten or Lee. Now, they're in great condition, and this is nothing new for them. They've done it throughout their well careers. I can speak very well this, by the but, way. <laughs> but as a fullback who – I mean, that's as physically abusing a position as you can play in the league. What's it like – because it, it's not just a Monday night to a Sunday game. It's traveling overnight and getting mm-hmm. home at 5 a.m. on a Tuesday. Yeah, and so I, I thought you were getting at the older guys and not recovering the well, same. No, but, but, but no, yeah, it's, to, it, to, it, the, to the it, point of that. It is the truth, right? You've got to be – and they're, they're pros, that like the ultimate pro. And so they take care of their body. They're doing the things that they need to do. They're eating right. They're getting in the recovery baths. They're doing all the things they need to do. But still, it's different at 35 and 33 than it was when you're 25 to recover. Because, and here's the thing, it's like you have the bye week and you're rested. And so this week is not going to be awful. I think you'll bounce back better. But the next couple weeks coming up and the schedule that we have in front of us. It's five games in 25 days. That's that's exactly right. And here's the deal, though, is is. And you know everybody's on Coach Garrett, but Coach Garrett is so prepared and so calculated that two weeks leading into the bye, he's already saying, "Okay, just so you guys are aware, we're not thinking about it, but just understand, take care of your bodies now because we have a rough six week stretch right. coming up after the bye." And then you come into the bye, and he's preparing them, saying, "Listen, don't go out and run the streets. Don't go out and be stupid because we have a long schedule that we need to win a lot of those games coming out of the bye." So the older guys talking about the next couple of weeks. This week won't be awful. Um, you know, Coach Garrett's giving them some time today. So generally on a Wednesday, it's their work day, right? They're in, and so that's only one day off. So he gave them yesterday off. Today is a late day, coming in, doing some stuff later than they normally would. So it'll be a reduced um, physical week. Yeah, they're not going to have a physical practice on Wednesday no, that you normally still would. Still put in, still put in the mm-hmm. the uh, physical or the mental hours that they got to mm-hmm. do, right? And so uh, time in the class is great. And then they'll work them out. This week is not going to be bad. I think that we'll see them perform because coming after the bye, you know, yes, you're refreshed, but there's also that sense of, okay, we got to get back in the rhythm. Not that we're losing it, but like we got to, okay, we're clicking on all cylinders and you saw the second half. It was a completely different team. Same deal. Yeah. But you come into this week, I think, you know, I anticipate them to be clicking on all cylinders. It's the following weeks after that that you got to be aware of and say, okay, look, you know, we've got Minnesota this week. You know, we've got New England in the Uh, near future. You know, Detroit's no pushover. Detroit, and we've got Buffalo. Uh I mean, this is a really, really tough schedule that we got ahead of us. So keep an eye out the next couple weeks, and that's why I think that they're keeping all you know circling back to our very. First, per, first part of this conversation was why we're resting Leighton the way that we are. Right. A neck injury is one of those things that only time can heal it. There's not really, you can rehab, you can ice bath, you can stem, you can stretch, you can do all those things, but time is what's going to relax that neck, you know, if it's a strained neck. So to go continue to beat it down through these five weeks, then now you're not going to have them in the postseason, at least at the level that you want them to. Well, let's talk about the uh, Vikings defense because uh, Cowboys mm-hmm. Nation fondly remembers Mike Zimmer for the yes. success that he had here. First as the yeah. defensive backs coach and winning Super Bowl rings, and then mm-hmm. of course took over as the defensive coordinator. But what is Zimmer's reputation around the league among players? Yeah, so the guys really respect him. Um, I kind of in all aspects of 
of the word. Like he's similar to a Marinelli, right? People just know that his defenses play hard. They hit hard. They're aggressive, but they're disciplined too. Um, and you know, I work with Darren Woodson. We've talked about it a handful of times, and he still. Uh, I mean, he texts Zimmer on you know once a month. They're talking about something. Yeah. Now, and we should point out that Zim was Darren Woodson's position coach, coach that's before right. becoming yes. his coordinator. That's that's mm-hmm. right. And so very well respected. And and his defenses are all, always come to play. He's always got a good edge rusher. You know, Everson Griffin is one of those guys that has evolved over the years mm-hmm. and become a, a great player. You got a great linebacker core there yeah. and then you know traditionally they have solid safeties hence the Darren Woodsons and the guys that that uh, that he had here um, but you know it'll be interesting to see you know how we attack this offense you know Kellen in the mind that he or this defense I'm sorry the mind that Kellen has is what is he going to be able to do to this you know traditional you know, traditional type defense that Zimmer has ran over the years. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned Everson Griffin. He's got five and a half uh, sacks. Daniel Hunter, eight and a half. That's uh, where the Vikings have really gotten an edge this mm-hmm. year. That The numbers, comparing the Cowboys' defense to the Vikings' defense – it, Tyler, it is eerie how close they are. In total mm-hmm. defense, the Cowboys are number six, Minnesota's number seven. Oh. Total defense is yards per game. Yeah. It's less than two yards difference. Yeah. Now, the run defense, <laughs> the Cowboys give up 97.3 yards per game. The Vikings, 95.8, less than two <laughs> yards. Pass defense, Cowboys are number seven, Vikings are number eight, 220 yards allowed and 225 yards allowed, respectively. Mm-hmm. Scoring defense, bottom, you know, those are just numbers. What matters is scoring. The Cowboys defense is number five, allowing 17.8 points per game. The Vikings number four, 17.6. The difference is um, sacks. Now, granted, the Vikings have played one more game. They're six and three. The Cowboys are five and three. So one more game. They have 28 sacks on the season. The Cowboys have 22. The difference is with the uh, takeaways, in particular interceptions, Mm -hmm. it goes to the ball hawk, you know, getting good pressure up front and ball hawking safeties and cornerbacks on the backside. They have eight this year, led by uh, Anthony Harris, who has three. So um, it's eerie how close it is. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking that it's going to be a pretty low scoring game to be honest with you you know what makes me like think it reminds these defenses of each other is you look at the quarterbacks right Dak had a little stretch where he he struggled for whatever reason it was this year and he had a couple a couple weeks where he didn't look like himself like he did the first three weeks you know Kirk Cousins was the same earlier in the season he did not start off strong in these the defense carried them yeah. and when they did not play well the team didn't play well and so it's very similar where the defense has had to carry this offense both offenses um, when uh, when they didn't play well so it, it'll be I mean this matchup will be really fun to watch I mean I'm glad it's a night game Kirk traditionally doesn't play well at night <laughs> um, you know whatever that, what a bummer to have to sit around all day and wait. I know you, you know whenever it, I do not like Monday night games or Sunday night games in terms of having to wait around all day. So yeah. when Carrie Underwood says, been waiting all day for Sunday night, I'm like, yes, and it, yes. it, it yeah. it's not fun. I'll say I was the same way. I did not like night games. I mean, the atmosphere is cool and it's great, but I, I really like, I wake up and ready to go. Like, I yeah. don't want to, I don't want to wait around and then, but then you've got to like temper yourself through the day and then you got to, yeah. okay. Cause I like, I would turn on the clock. Really, I started on Saturday. It was kind of my day. But, um, you know, a long day, a Sunday night game or Monday night game, <laughs> it's like, okay, please, let's go. So I'm always at the stadium like yeah. six hours early yeah. sitting yeah, around. Just and, wait. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, a lot of nervous energy. That's trying. Right. If it comes down to the very end, um, Dan Bailey and Brett Maher. Yeah. Dan Bailey, by the way, having a very good year for the Vikings after struggling mm-hmm. the previous couple years. He's 13 of 15 this year, 86.7%. Mm-hmm. So... Um, Hard to root against Dan Bailey, yeah. such a great guy, but Brett Maher is as well. And he had won special teams player of the week the week before. Yeah. Before we get out of here, Tyler, um, you're, I know that uh, you're uh, going to leave here and head up to Prosper to speak yeah. to the high school football team yeah. there. Tell us about uh, who you're working with and your message. Yeah, so uh, I, I have the privilege of being a part of a group called New Friends, New Life here in Dallas. And uh, what it is, it's an anti trafficking organization that, that helps women um, that have been. Uh, you know, involved in human trafficking in some sort or another. Uh, you know, unfortunately in Dallas, there's 400 teens on the street that are trafficked every night in Dallas. These are teens, underage teens. 
Um, so it, it really is, you know, Texas is the second largest uh, population of, of victims of human trafficking uh, in the United States. And so it's an issue. And, and I'm a part of a group called the Men's Advocacy Group that supports New Friends, New Life. And we have an initiative called the Man Kindness Project. And so what we do is we go in and we talk to young boys, junior high and high school, and talk to them what it really looks like to be a man. Right, what it looks like and what our responsibility as a man is and what it looks like to respect a woman and the activities that you engage in that culture says is okay to do at this age, what that can turn into and the addictions that that can cause later on. But ultimately, we just want to go and show them like, you know, you know, and let's be let's be frank here. Sexual conquest does not make you a man. Mm-hmm. And it's, and at that age, you know, hormones and all that, like that's something that you battle with. And I think every boy does. And so just talking through like, okay, you know, what is it, what does it sound like in the locker room, you know, in a typical locker room and you can be different and you can change a trajectory of someone's life and then ultimately not be the driver of the demand for those right. victims that are being trafficked. Right. It's, it's supply and demand. That's so, exactly right. Uh-huh. So if, if there are men that don't have that addiction that needs to be filled by a, a, a victim of, of trafficking, then the industry goes away. And so it's, it's, it's one of those things, my wife and I were passionate about it when, uh, you know, we serve an international group and then also this one locally and, um, just go speak to, speak to them. And, and then it's also just speaking life into them too. It's not just yeah. about, it's about what, what is it, what's your responsibility as a man, as you grow, grow older and, you know, serving the community and doing things beyond yourself. And it's not all about just selfish ambitions. Well, that's what makes this sport so great is the, mm-hmm. it's really more the lessons off the field that's right. you know, or, that's ha- right. or how you apply the lessons of football. That's right. And, you know, field. and here, and, and I'll, I'll wrap up with this is, is it's so great because the Cowboys are such an incredible organization. But with that, with that, it becomes the exceptional platform to do some things. And that's what's so great about these guys. I mean, you look at Dak and you look at some of the Witten and a lot of Witten does so much in the community, but he's just so quiet about it. And he doesn't want to like advertise in your face and the things that he does. But there's so many other guys in that locker room that have taken the platform of the Dallas Cowboys and gone and done something and made a change and affected lives for the positive. And that's what it's all about because football goes away. But what's the eternal impact that you can make on people? Well, thanks for doing that this afternoon and all the other things. So on behalf of Tyler, on behalf of, uh, yay, he deserves it for William and for Brad Sham, who will be back with us on uh, Monday. We miss you, Brad. See you Monday. Thank you all for joining us on Radio Heads. This has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this,